Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Leonard. I'm the Executive Director of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. And the feast day of St. Luke is upon us, and so I asked my friend Dr. John Bergsma, who is a biblical guru, to come and talk to us about this great biblical author. And John is a convert to the church and an associate professor of theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville. But he's not just any professor, he's actually been voted Faculty of the Year not once, but twice by graduating students. And John gets around, so maybe you've seen him on EWTN, heard him on the radio, or maybe one of the many conferences at which he now speaks and draws those crazy little pictures for which he's becoming so well known. In fact, you can see those great little pictures in his excellent new book called Bible Basics for Catholics, a new picture of salvation history, which you can find in the bookstore at salvationhistory.com. So, welcome John. It's great to be here, Matt. Who was St. Luke? Now, you know, lots of times I think we have a tendency to confuse him with one of the Twelve Apostles because he wrote one of the Gospels. Right. He wasn't. So who was he? Right. Well, he's what we call an apostolic man. The, uh, the church uh, talks about the Gospels being written either by apostles or apostolic men. And apostolic men are, are, is the term that we give to um, those who associated with the apostles, even though uh, they may not have been apostles themselves. So uh, two apostles wrote Gospels, Matthew and John, and two apostolic men wrote Gospels, Luke and uh, Mark. So uh, Luke is a, a pivotal fig uh, figure in uh, the early church and in the history of our faith. Uh, he's the only Gentile uh, to write a book of the New Testament. Um, and he wrote more of the New Testament than any other uh, biblical author. Uh, so uh, in addition to his Gospel, uh, Gospel Luke, which is the longest Old Testament book, he also penned uh, a sequel, uh, Acts, which is the second longest of the New Testament books, and together they make up um, around a third of the uh, length of the, of the New Testament. So we're greatly indebted to, um, to St. Luke uh, for um, giving us so many uh, memories of our Lord and of the early church. Now, sometimes we hear he was a doctor, maybe he was well-educated. What can you bring out about that? Sure. Well, there's different traditions that uh, have been passed down in the church about uh, his profession. Um, but uh, the dominant one is uh, that he was a doctor. We can't prove that, um, but it is evident from his writings that he certainly was an educated professional. Uh, he had a uh, fabulous grasp of the uh, Greek language um, and uh, could write in several different Greek styles, including a very high style. He could also write in the language of the man on the street, and uh, he could write with a, a Jewish idiom, uh, and he could make himself sound like... Uh, the uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament that was widely used by the Jews. So he was a very skillful, uh, well-educated writer, wide vocabulary. So definitely an, an educated man um, and uh, remembered, as I said, for, uh, for being a, a doctor and also for his association with our Blessed Mother. Um, the, uh, the first two chapters of Luke um, are the longest accounts of the childhood of our Lord. And uh, he speaks of Mary uh, having pondered those events in her heart, and Blessed uh, John Paul II uh, expressed the, the common tradition of the Church that that was indicating where Luke was getting his information from, that he got his first two chapters of his Gospel from the Blessed Mother. Who was he writing for? Uh, he was definitely writing uh, primarily to um, uh, educated uh, Greco-Roman um, citizens who um, were, had, had at least some openness uh, to learning about um, the gospel, learning about uh, uh, this man that they were hearing about uh, named Jesus of Nazareth. He might have been writing specifically for um, uh, Greek-speaking Gentiles um, who uh, were what we call God-fearers, that is, um, Gentiles who did not completely convert to Judaism, which would have involved circumcision, but did uh, at least come to the synagogues to hear the scriptures being read. And I would say that that was probably the bullseye of his target audience. And then if you went to the next ring, it was probably educated uh, Greek speakers in the Roman Empire generally. And then the next ring out would be just anybody who picked up his gospel. Okay. Now, lots of times, a lot of our viewers will have noticed that there are sometimes the same stories that you read about right. in multiple gospels. What is it that makes Luke unique? Because even though he follows the same storyline as Matthew and Mark, generally speaking, there are some unique features here. So what would yeah, be some of those? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, his first two chapters, his uh, stories about the uh, childhood and infancy of our Lord and of the uh, holy uh, uh, parents uh, of our Lord and uh, St. John the Baptist, all that's unique uh, to Luke. So around Christmas time, we're so reliant on Luke uh, for our information for that great feast. 
and in the Liturgy of the Hours, the uh, New Testament canticles like the uh, Song of Zechariah, the Magnificat, uh, the Benedictus, um, those, uh, those canticles that are prayed in the liturgy, um, those are all coming from Luke. So definitely his first two chapters are, are unique to him. Also in Luke 10 through 19, it's a lot of unique material, treasured stories of the gospel that we would be greatly in debt if we didn't have. Things like uh, the Good Samaritan, uh, the Prodigal Son, the Rich Man and Lazarus. All those um, parables are recorded only by Luke, and if we didn't have his gospel, we'd never have known those those accounts. And then in the Passion narrative, um, he has unique points. He's the one who, who records our Lord saying, this is the new covenant over the cup, which of course is very important in terms of biblical theology. Going back to the prophets like Jeremiah 31, 31, he prophesied the coming of a new covenant. St. Luke picks that up as he records our Lord's, Lord's words. And then the, the, the story of the road to Emmaus, uh, that's so meaningful to so many people, that too is unique to Luke, and, and uh, we only have it recorded in his gospel. And you mentioned earlier that there, you know, Luke wrote Luke, but he also wrote Acts, and that's there's correct. a connection between the two of them, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Luke strives very hard to show a continuity between the ministry of our Lord and the, the ministries of Peter and Paul, especially in the book of Acts. And so when you look at um, the ministries of Peter and Paul in Acts, you'll see them performing similar miracles to our Lord, uh, as in uh, raising a, 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 a dead young girl. Okay, uh, Peter does that in Acts. Our Lord did that in the Gospels, um, uh, healing the lame, um, uh, exorcisms, and so on. We see the repetition of similar kinds of great signs uh, in the ministries of Peter and Paul, showing that the same Holy Spirit that was at work in our Lord is still now at work in the Apostles. Uh, in addition, there's a, an interesting theme, especially for us Catholics, when we look at Luke and Acts, that there are ten meal scenes with our Lord in the book of Luke. And then there's a continuity at the beginning of Acts where our Lord eats with the apostles in Acts 1-4, and then throughout the rest of Acts, the apostles uh, do what Luke calls breaking the bread, which is his early terminology for the Eucharist. And so when you put the Gospel of Luke together with Acts, you see a continuity between the meals of our Lord and then the Eucharist that's celebrated by the apostles and ultimately by the apostles' successors in the early church. Now, following up on that, you know, both of us are converts, and so we didn't really grow up seeing the, the book of Acts as very Catholic. Right. But it really is. Yes. And, and he lays out for us the four fundamental elements of the Holy Mass. Break yeah. that down for us. Ab absolutely. In, in uh, Acts 2, we have the account of Pentecost, of course. And after we have the mass conversion and baptism of those 3,000 first Christians around about Acts 2.38, you move down to Acts 2.42, and it talks about them devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, um, to uh, the prayers, and the breaking of bread. Um, so those four elements uh, are really the fundamentals of the mass. The apostles' teaching, of course, would be the scripture readings, uh, the fellowship, um, would be things like the passing of the peace that uh, express our community as Christians. Um, the uh, prayers uh, run throughout, and then the breaking of the bread is specifically uh, the early language for the Eucharistic liturgy. John and I were talking a few days ago here at the center, and one of the things that you mentioned to me was that Luke, more so than any of the other gospel writers, emphasizes three things, and I found this really fascinating. So you said the Holy Spirit, women, and prayer. That's right. So how so? Let's start with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, well, uh, it's, it's interesting when you read the, the first two chapters of Luke, again, the infancy narratives that, uh, that we all know and love uh, as Catholics and as Christians generally. Um, the Holy Spirit is already active there uh, on these uh, holy men and women, St. Elizabeth, St. Zachariah, um, our Blessed Mother. Um, you just read through those stories and the, the Spirit is always moving on them, causing them to, to cry out in prayer and in song uh, to the Lord. Um, and, and there, the, the Holy Spirit is impelling their prayer. So the Magnificat is kind of a prayer of praise from, our, from our, uh, our Blessed Mother, and it's motivated by the Holy Spirit as the Spirit moves on her. Um, so you see that, and then, and then in the Gospels, it's, in the rest of the Gospel of Luke, uh, it's very interesting that um, in stories where Matthew or Mark o omit or forget to mention that our Lord is praying, Luke never does. So at the baptism, uh, Luke makes it clear our Lord was praying when he came up out of the water, and then the Holy Spirit came upon him. So Luke stresses that connection between prayer and the Holy Spirit. In one sense, the Holy Spirit causes us to pray, and in another sense, the Holy Spirit comes as a response to our prayer. And if Jesus had to pray, we have to. We, <laughs> we have to yeah. as well. Absolutely. Well, well great. Uh, thank you very much. No, I welcome. appreciate it.
And if you're looking for any more free, great resources on sacred scripture, we've got a lot by Dr. Bergsma up at SalvationHistory.com, as well as Dr. Scott Hahn and many others. So please see us there at SalvationHistory.com, and don't forget to check us out on Facebook as well. Thank you.